Hey, welcome everyone who's logged on for our webinar this afternoon. Uh, I'm really glad you had an opportunity to join us today for one of my favorite subjects. We're going to talk about making predictions. Uh, it's been one of my favorite subjects because most investors, I think, labor under the illusion that to be a good investor, they have to be able to make exceptionally good predictions to be successful. Uh, maybe you felt this way when faced with an investment decision in the past. You think, if only I knew what was going to happen next, I'd fill in the blank and you'd have the perfect action. Uh, what we're going to do with our time together today, I hope, is see that prediction, that prediction mindset really is counterproductive for investors. Not only is it not necessary, it really, in some cases, is the exact opposite of good investment decision making. As we get started today, um, just kind of as a brief reminder, we've got about 30 minutes on tap. Uh, hopefully, I'll take a little bit less than that and have time for question and answers. We're recording the webinar and we'll send a link out when we're done in the next few days. Uh, there's a place on your software, on the Zoom software for you to go to a chat tab. And if you have some questions, you can put those in and we'll be monitoring those here. And as we have time, we'll answer them at the end. And if we don't get to all the questions today, we will follow up via email to make sure we get your, your questions answered. Uh, also, for many of those who may not be familiar with Foster Group, we're an independent wealth management firm based in West Des Moines with an office in Omaha as well. We work with individuals and institutions and retirement plans. Really, our goal is to help people successfully plan and invest in every economic environment. Um, by the way, I'm Kent Kramer. I'm currently the Chief Investment Officer here at Foster Group. And we have the privilege of managing a little bit over $2.3 billion today for clients of all kinds. Uh, sometimes we hear a prediction that sounds so outlandish, we use phrases like this one to describe the likelihood of the thing happening. And if you remember, 2016 seemed to be a good year for flying pigs. The UK voted to leave the European Union, Brexit as we call it now. Uh, in October of that year, the Cubs won the World Series. And then in November, uh, really shockingly, a TV reality star and sometimes successful real estate developer actually became president of the United States. Uh, like the series on television, Stranger Things, the things that seem unthinkable do happen from time to time maybe more often uh, than we realize. As we think about these kind of pigs flying events and how they affect our portfolios, one of the things at Foster Group that we've done is we've developed five key ideas that we think are important for getting to better investment outcomes. And we're gonna spend our time today particularly talking about the second one on this list, which is embracing uncertainty. And the reason I think it's so important that we embrace uncertainty is because so much of life is uncertain. We can either put ourselves in a posture of trying to deny the reality that the unthinkable can't happen, or we can really accept the idea that the future is very uncertain. We can, in a sense, embrace it, and we can make decisions to make the most of the range of possibilities that are out in front of us. If you think about uncertainty, it affects every part of the environment that we live in. If our employment is uncertain. Certainly investment markets are uncertain. Weather, economics, sports, health politics, you just almost can't name an area of life where there isn't a degree of uncertainty that we're faced with every day. So let's look at an area of uncertainty where people have made it into a kind of an entertainment uh, area. So sports betting is a huge and growing industry. It's built on this combination of uncertainty, prediction, and probability. So at the beginning of this past season, the 2019 season, if you equal weighted all the NFL teams, they'd have about a 3% chance, one in 36, of winning the 2020 Super Bowl, which will be played uh, here in a couple weeks in Miami. Not great odds if you're trying to pick or predict just one winner. You got a one in 36 shot. Now there's a little probability that comes with that, right? Because back in October, if you looked at 538.com, which is a leading statistical and prediction website, it showed the New England Patriots as the most likely to win with a 27% chance, while rating the other uh, NFL teams going down to the very bottom dwelling Miami Dolphins at less than 1%. We saw the Patriots didn't quite make it. So we can see it's a little tough to predict which team is going to actually get to and win the Super Bowl. What if we looked at a different kind of a wager to raise our odds of success? In this one, you can choose to bet, but you only have to predict which conference is going to win the game. So instead of 1 in 36 or 1 in 32, your, your chances goes to 1 in 2. So you've really moved the odds in your favor from you know, less than around 3% to about a 50% shot of getting it right, even by chance. Now let's go one step further here and introduce some probability to our 
potential prediction or bet. This is a little a bit of a nuance here. So instead of predicting what's going to happen just in this Super Bowl coming up in a couple of weeks, what if we were going to predict kind of the, the average result in terms of which conference wins the Super Bowl the most over the next 20 Super Bowls, over the next 20 years? So again, you have two possibilities available. Prediction A is that the conferences split the games pretty evenly over the next 20 years. With the odds above on your screen here, you'll see prediction A gives you outcomes including an even-even split, so they split 10 and 10, or it goes 9 and 11 either way. Either the AFC or the NFC wins 9 and the other conference wins 11. So you can see historically over 53 Super Bowls, A was the winning bet. Prediction B is that one conference will get the better of the other, winning at least 12 of the next 20 doesn't matter which conference wins the 12. You're just betting on an uneven split. In this case, you get 18 of the possible 21 outcomes. And over the last 10 Super Bowls, bet B won. So looking at the next 20 years, which side of the bet do you want? Would you demand a better payout if you're going to take side B? In other words, if you're going to take the chance that maybe one conference was going to dominate? Would you be willing to take a little less return to go with prediction A, that it's going to be more of an even split? What if, instead of the next 20 years, we said, hey, let's look at the next 50 years and look at the same odds? Would that make you feel better or worse in terms of predicting what you think the outcome might be? For most of us, as you lengthen the time frame involved, as you increase the number of observations, the likelihood or the probability of making a good prediction, what I would call in this case, you're not really predicting, but you're actually looking at the future and you're forming an expectation of what the future might look like. The thing about predicting is it's just hard, especially when it has to do with near-term events. Um, it's a little bit, I tell people when they ask me what I think is going to happen next year, they say, hey, look into your crystal ball. I tell them, you know, my crystal ball looks a little bit like a bowling ball. It's not very transparent. It is hard for me to think about successful predictions, particularly when it's in the near term. This idea of successful investing being reliant on making good prediction really creates a lot of pressure to be right. And I think it's pressure that investors don't need to feel. One of the greatest investors of all time talked about this idea of forecasting. And he's talked about it in a lot of different ways, but he said that forecasts may tell you a great deal about the forecaster. They tell you nothing about the future. And what Mr. Buffett is saying here is, hey, Unless you're a long-term investor, the idea of trying to make predictions about the short term really is a loser's game. He's always been a long-term investor, and that's led to a great deal of investment success and a lot of fame and wealth for him and his family. So instead of thinking about predictions or guessing to be right or wrong in investing, let's think about reframing the way we think about investing. Instead of predicting, what if we use the word preparing? Instead of having to predict outcomes, what if we prepared for multiple possible outcomes? If we can't know the future precisely, can we still prepare for it generally? Chess grandmasters over the last few years have increasingly employ, employed something called positional chess as a strategy versus combination chess. What they're doing is they're saying instead of trying to predict which combinations of moves an opponent will make, the positional player tries to get their pieces positioned on the board so that they can take advantage of offensive opportunities should they arise, or they can be in position to play defense if the game moves in that direction. How we frame our approach to a problem will have a lot to do about how we feel about our approach and how successful we are over long periods of time in looking at it. Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman were famous behavioral psychologists. They did a lot of work around decision-making economic decision-making and things like that. And one of the things that they discovered is that all of us have certain kind of biases that make us pretty bad at statistics on the fly. And really, if we're trying to make predictions, oftentimes it's a statistical question, it's a probability question. And if we try and make a snap decision, a, a prediction, what they would say is we're really overconfident in our ability to predict and understand the future. So instead of falling into that prediction mindset, which is full of biases and error, they say, hey, let's reframe the way we think about decisions. And so when I think about reframing a successful investment mindset, what I want to help people do is move from a speculation mindset 
to an expectation mindset. And that's what we're looking here in our picture here. In a speculation mindset, you're trying to make a prediction between A or B, one or the other. I, I have to either win or lose this thing. In an expectation mindset, it's A and B. The stock market is gonna go up some years and it's gonna go down some years, but over time, it's likely to go up more than it goes down. So the time horizon to determine success for the speculator is very short. I have to be right next week. I have to be right next year. For the expectational investor, I have a long period of time to evaluate my success to be successful to actually see a positive return. The instinctual behavior of a speculator is again, that prediction mindset. We think of, I have to predict what's going to happen next to be successful. Whereas in an expectational mindset, I can prepare I can think about long term and I can be successful over that longer period of time. I don't have to be right, particularly about what happens tomorrow. We can see this in a couple different investment examples that some of you might be familiar with. This picture just displays and ranks the returns of different kinds of asset classes around the world by year. So what you're looking at here is each asset class is ranked in order of return, highest to lowest, in each year going back to 2004. And what you can see here is there doesn't appear to be a pattern as to which investment asset class is gonna win from year to year. As a matter of fact, it's virtually impossible. Academic studies would say the idea of predicting which one is gonna be the winner from year to year is basically a statistical impossibility. You might get it right, but the likelihood there is that you were just a good guesser or you got lucky in that one particular year. The same thing is true when you look at equity returns in developed markets. So if we look at stock returns in different kinds of in different countries, what we see here is the same issue. Over time, who the winners are and who the losers are varies from year to year. But just like in looking at those asset classes, for an investor who stayed invested in a diversified group of these stock markets or the asset classes that we just saw over a long period of time, well, the expected return and the actual return for investors was positive, very positive actually over these time periods. You did not need to be a successful predictor to have a successful experience as an investor in participating in equity markets. Now let's look at something that kind of got a lot of attention starting last year in terms of some noise around, hey, here's something that we should be looking at in order to predict what's gonna happen in investment markets. And it has to do with something called the inverted yield curve. So last year in 2019, for the first time in a long time, the yield curve inverted. Let's talk for a minute about this, what this yield curve tells us. The blue line here is what you'd call a normalized or a normal yield curve. What that means is short-term interest rates are lower than long-term interest rates. So the rate, in this case, we're talking about US Treasury securities. So the rate on 30-day and one-year and two-year securities in treasury bills bears a lower interest rate than out here in the 30 year treasury. Now this blue curve was from late 2017. And this makes sense. You think if you're gonna give your money for a short period of time, you're gonna expect maybe a little bit less return than if you give your money to someone for a long period of time. So what happened in 2019 was kind of an anomaly. It doesn't happen very often, but the yield curve became inverted. And what happened was, as the Federal Reserve raised rates, short-term rates actually got higher than some of the longer-term rates. This is an unusual thing, it doesn't happen very often, and it gets a lot of people's attention when it does, and certainly the financial press began talking about this inverted yield curve as though the end of the world was actually coming uh, when it happened in 2019. Now, why are people so concerned about this inverted yield curve? Well, here's the question. People say, well, the inverted yield curve signals that a recession is coming. So, you have to ask ourselves, is a recession coming? I would say the answer is almost certainly yes. We will likely have another recession in the history of the United States at some point. The question really is, when will it come? And how bad will it be when it arrives? Dr. Cameron Harvey, the Duke professor who did most of the work around this idea of recessions following yield curve inversions, one of the things that he makes the case about, he says, yes, they do tend to follow, but also in his research, what he found is the timing of when the recession is gonna come after the inversion and how deep the recession will be after the inversion 
is not really predictable. That's not what the inverted yield curve tells us. It just tells us that a recession is closer now than it was in the past. In other uh, studies around this idea of recessions following yield curve inversions, I'm just gonna quote one here that I think is interesting. It says, however, three other features of the data, this is Cameron Harvey's data, illustrate that the yield curve's predictive power should not be overstated. First, there can be a considerable lag between when the yield curve inverts and when the economy enters into recession. Second, this time lag varies. And third, sometimes the yield curve has inverted without a subsequent recession, if you look back further in history. So this chart is just showing kind of, here's the, the inversions are when you see the red line go below zero. And then you can see the recession are these gray areas when the recession actually began. You can see that in a lot of cases, the inversion happened months, maybe even years before the actual recession kicked in. So what does that mean for investors? One of the things that gets confusing when we read financial information is we confuse something like the recession, which is at least two quarters of negative economic growth, with what's actually happening in the stock market. It turns out that the, what the stock market returns look like and what GDP growth looks like in terms of economic growth and what we're doing to measure recession, they're not really perfectly correlated. So on this chart, what we put together is again, that same picture of yield curve inversions. And then at the same time, what happened to the stock market throughout those periods of all those inversions? And what statistics would tell us is, well, they're not necessarily perfectly correlated and for the longer term investor, the person who is prepared to be an investor for a long period of time, what you can see in this picture is stock market investors did reasonably well if they just stayed invested in the market throughout those inversions and the subsequent recessions. Even as the yield curve continually changed shape, the general direction of the US stock market was upward. Let's look at that in a little bit more detail and see why this is so hard to predict. And really the question would be, if we even could predict what was gonna happen with recessions, would it be worth our time? So let's first look at, here's the last nine recessions. And you can see the GDP total contraction column here. The average or the median was negative 2.2%. The duration averaged about 10 months and the time until the next recession was four years and two months. So there's about five years in between recessions it looks like and the median GDP contraction again remember this is not the stock market return this is what happened with GDP now let's look at how this affects investors same time periods the last nine recessions and what I want us to focus on here is this is the stock market return during that recessionary period and what you see here is that four out of the nine periods the stock market was actually positive during the recession. If you look at the period of time one year prior to the recession, again, you have a you know, significant number of positive returns one year prior, six out of the nine. And then if you go post-recession, what you find is eight out of the nine for the year post-recession, three years, all of them, five years, all of them. So the question is, if the average negative return during recession was just a negative 1.6%, and granted, there were some pretty bad returns in some of those recessions, but for a long-term investor, if the average negative return was 1.6% and the positive one years on either side were six and 15, what this says is, if we got the timing, if we predicted the timing of the recession wrong, we would have lost by getting out early, as much as 6%, or we would have lost by getting back in late as much as 15%. Let's think for a minute about last year. We had this inversion, get all this press starting in last March. If you had gotten out, think of what you would have missed. Last year, the US stock market was up over 30%, and in the fourth quarter of the year alone, it was up over 10%. You can see the cost of being wrong with a prediction in the short term can be dramatic, for an investor who needs long-term returns to succeed. This chart is just another way of saying the same thing. All we're showing in this chart is, hey, what's the cost of missing really, really good days? So if I look at the S&P 500, the US stock market going back to 1990 through 2018, the total period return averaged just over nine and a quarter percent. 
if I had missed just the one best day in that period of time, my return would have dropped by almost a half a percent from 9.29 to 8.87. If I had missed the five best days, I'd drop even more. If I missed the 25 best days, now my return is half of what was available if I'd just been a long-term investor and stayed invested the entire time. The point here is not trying to predict when the best days will be or won't be. The point really is, if the cost is that high in being wrong in our predictions, wouldn't it be better to take the return that's available to us by just preparing our portfolio to participate and get those returns across the whole period? So 2020 is an election year. Last year we had a lot of talk around an inversion. This year, my prediction, and I'm pretty sure I'm gonna get this prediction right, is that in 2020, we are gonna hear a ton of predictions about who is gonna win the Democratic nomination and who is gonna ultimately win the presidential election. I think I'm pretty safe in making that prediction. What I want us to look back as and think about a little bit is what 2016 was like. So here's the last time we went through this kind of election cycle. And if you remember the year, as the year went along, volatility in equity markets really started to pick up through the summer and then into the fall. And why was it picking up? Because we were getting closer to the election. There was a kind of an uncertainty about who was gonna win. It was fairly tight. Initially, it looked like Secretary Clinton had a significant lead and it was unlikely that she was gonna lose. The market seemed to like that sense of her winning. Now, whether they liked it because they liked her policy or they just liked the certainty or the predictability of the fact that she might win, it's really impossible to know. But the fact was, as the election got closer and closer and the polls tightened up, when Secretary Clinton looked like she was holding on to her lead, the market would kind of be steady and slightly positive. And when Mr. Trump looked like he was getting a lead at the time, now President Trump, the market reacted very skittishly and it actually would go down. And you'd see this kind of pattern. Polls would come out. If Trump started to get in ahead, it looked like markets were getting skittish and worried. If Secretary Clinton was taking the lead, it seemed like markets would stabilize and maybe go up a little bit. Then came the election. And what happened on election night? I'm an election junkie, so I'm staying up late. I'm watching this on all the different news channels at home. And about midnight, it becomes apparent that then Mr. Trump, now President Trump, is going to win the election. And you could watch, I was watching stock futures all night long, which are trading kind of in anticipation of what the market's gonna do the next morning. And as it became increasingly clear that Mr. Trump was gonna become President Trump, stock market futures in the US just began to plummet. At one point, it looked like the US stock market was gonna open as much as eight to 10% down when it opened the morning after the election. I was furiously writing a blog post getting ready to send out to our investors saying, hey, don't worry about it. Things are going to be OK. Before I had a chance to finish that blog and get it published, we saw futures start to flatten out. And by the morning, while the market did open slightly negative, it wasn't nearly as negative as it was at about 1 a.m. And by the end of the day, it had almost fully recovered. Then what happened next was really shocking. And this is why I put this picture up on our chart here for us to look at is this is a picture of U.S. small companies. Their index is the Russell 2000, so it tracks the average of all those U.S. small companies. And it's looking at what happened in the 26 trading days post-election. So here you can see what was happening pre-election. Market's kind of trending down. Election day goes down. And then what happens? Wow, it just starts to go up and up and up. What was the new information? The new information was not that really now President Trump's policies had dramatically changed. It was just there was some certainty in who was going to win. And the market said, okay, now that we know, we're going to set aside all these other concerns that they must have had. And what we saw was a 19.5% increase in small company stocks in 26 trading days. The point here was if you had been predicting what was going to happen based on President Trump winning the election, everything that was going on was the prediction market was saying, stocks will do poorly if Trump wins the election. And in fact, the exact opposite thing happened. Pigs began to fly, basically, coming out of that election. And if you weren't present, you didn't win. If you weren't prepared to participate in the market, you didn't get the upward return. I think this year, in 2020, we're going to see some very similar things. I'm not saying that somebody's going to win and post-election, the market will go up. 
But I do think prior to the election, we as investors should expect to see quite a bit of volatility in stock prices that will be hard to explain as people try to understand, well, who might win the election and what might that mean for stock prices? The uncertainty alone will cause people to trade, will cause prices to go up and down, even though there's really no knowledge as to what's going to happen. Again, for the long-term investor, you can screen that out. You can avoid the pressure of feeling like you have to make a prediction about who's going to win in order to be a successful investor. Because as we've seen before, whether we're trying to predict things from inverted yield curves and recessions, or we're trying to predict the results of elections, that is not what it takes to be a successful investor. What it takes to be a successful investor is a plan, is a sense of preparation, a long-term view, and then staying in your portfolio through all those periods of time to make sure that you get the return that's available to you. So a couple takeaways here as we finish up. First is again, you don't have to be a master of prediction to be a successful investor. Almost all of us will just be better off resisting the urge to act on short-term predictions and to choose long-term preparation instead. So we would just kind of suggest these four things. Resist the temptation to act on short-term short predictions. If, if watching the news causes more pressure, stop watching the news. And I'm quite serious about that. We've had a lot of discussions with our investors and they'll call in, they'll be very worried about something. I'll say, how much news are you watching? And there'll be kind of some silence on the other end of the phone and what, they'll, what they're telling me is they watch the news a lot. And I say, well, maybe you'd like to watch the news a little bit less. That would take some of the pressure off, feeling like you need to do something. You need to embrace longer term expectations around markets that are based on evidence and probability as opposed to things that are trying to be predicted in the day-to-day -day press. And what we do with that is we prepare and you want to prepare your overall portfolio to capture those long-term expectations, which raise your probability of long-term success. Finally, if you do feel the urge to speculate, perhaps the 49ers, perhaps the 49ers. Now, I don't have a dog in this fight this year but it seems like those guys are awfully good. I wouldn't put a lot of money on either one. And if you're a long-term speculator, perhaps in 2021, the Vikings will get a little bit further than they did in 2019 and 2020. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're gonna wrap up this part of the webinar and we'll see um, if there are any questions that we need to answer today. It looks like, actually I'm getting a nod here that we're running out of time. So that means I've spoken long enough. You've probably been gracious to listen this time. If you do have any questions, you know you can please contact us. Um, here's where our contact information is. You can send us an email. You can check out our website. You can request a meeting with an advisor. We'd love to have a chance to talk with you at your convenience. So again, thanks for joining us today. Also, this thing is gonna be uh, recorded, so it'll be available if you wanna re-listen to it or see some of the uh, slides and think about them a little bit more. So with that, I'll sign off and hope to see you soon at Foster Group.